Thank you very much for not introducing me. Thank you. Um, great pleasure to be here. One of my favourite places with some of my favourite people. I mean, I mean, you're all my favourite people. Since some of them not, are not my favourite people, are not here. Um, so there are so many points of contact that I, I can't keep more in my head. Um, I'm going to go back to basics a bit and just review active inference and the free energy principle in a way that speaks to a lot of the questions, in particular the last few questions we've just had about um, how we can migrate insights about perception and predictive processing to, I think, the deeper question of active inference and querying our world, giving as an agency answering questions about how do we choose the sparse data in an optimal way uh, to build. Sorry. Yes, that's what really to the oh, I see. There was a, a handheld one. Oh, I got it. I got it. Oh, oh. Yeah, no. I, I'll use this one. That's the one. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Right, what was I saying? I was probably it said all the importance. Action. Action, that's right. So we're going um, to go from predictive processing to active inference. Um, and en route, I think, touch upon a lot of the key issues that we've just heard about. From a formal perspective, from a maths, from a physicist's perspective, everything that I'm going to talk about is exactly consistent with what I imagine uh, from a philosophical perspective you were saying in your talk. It also speaks very closely to some of the more formal issues about the neuronal code and what implications that may have for the sorts of um, contents, the things that we can represent. Uh, and happily, I'm also even going to do dogs and cats and variational <laughs> auto encoders as well. So that's all good. Um, I should confess that I've got enough material for about an hour and a half. Uh, so, what, so what I'm going to ask um, my chair to do, five minutes before my allotted 30 minutes, if you can tell me, and then what I'll do is I'll just literally just race through the slides to show you what you... <laughs> no, I'm serious about this, because all the interesting stuff is at the beginning. Uh, but just, you know, ha had this been a more informal workshop, what you would have seen, uh, so that we get plenty of time for, for, for discussion. So seriously, just, you know, I'll just stop when, 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 we, when we get to, the, get to that point. Um, so the interesting bit at the beginning Active inference and self-evidencing, and I'm using active inference uh, deliberately here because um, I repeat, it's going to be about how we as a self go and solicit Ghana evidence for our own internal models, our generative models of the world. And we're going to call that um, active inference. We're not going to use reinforcement learning. We're going to use exactly the same uh, objective function that the variational autoencoders use, variational free energy, and we're going to put into it, or we're going to unpack that objective function in a way that allows us to answer questions about how do you put prior preferences in, how do you do the epistemics properly. Um, I think underneath all this, though, it's all about me interrogating my world. So there's a sense in which that's the interesting stuff. Um, and in light of that, we're going to talk, uh, re uh, rehearse briefly generative models, but much of the hard work has already been done. Thank you very much, even down to the hidden Markov model. So we can skip through those. Uh, the stuff that I won't show, that I will skip through deliberately, is really for neurobiologists. That, you know, you've got these ideas in play, this formalism, uh, this math. How would it materially inform your experiments, what you'd look for with... Um, electroencephalography or psychophysics, but we won't be really focusing on that. If I have time, I'll just show you what, what, what I would have shown you in terms of state of the art in terms of using these sorts of schemes by simulating reading, so composing deep hierarchical uh, hidden Markov models to work out where to look next to gather the, re the best sort of evidence for what you believe is the current narrative in play that's generating your sensory impressions. Right, so very quickly, you've all seen this sort of thing before, the idea being that we're going to predicate everything upon the notion of a generative model. Your perception is basically what is inside your head, and sensations are just in the game of providing evidence for or against those beliefs. Uh, I like this example from, I think, the, the 16th century, a uh, famous oil painter who would 
paint these still lives, but when you invert the picture, they transpire to be faces. And the point that I would normally make here, a, if I had more time, is of course that percept is inside your head. That's all we're actually starting where you ended with your pretty faces. Um, these ideas you are more than familiar with. Um, some of the key architects of things like um, deep learning also figure in terms of uh, you know, the sort of brief history of the brain as uh, uh, a statistical organ, a, a generator of hypotheses or fantasies, nicely summarized here by Helmholtz's notion that objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous system. You've probably rehearsed many times the um, psychological gloss on that in terms of perception as hypothesis testing. That getting into uh, machine learning um, via people like Peter Dial and Jeffrey Hinton, and lots, of, uh, lots of people borrowing from Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian probability theory and statistical physics. Uh, to come up with notions of the Helmholtz machine, which were parallels. So this is the old school, I would imagine, uh, before it got um, um, overshadowed by deep learning. Uh, but very much these ideas have, uh, have developed in parallel. And if I understand your talk properly, now the generative models are coming back again and starting to, to address uh, you know, the, the new technology or the old equations with the new technology are now being turned to focus on some of the questions that were raised in machine learning by Geoffrey Hinton in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. So this notion um, as objects being in the field of vision as would have to be there to produce the same impression on the nervous system, very reminiscent of sensory uh, impressions, the shadows on Plato's cave. And our job, the brain's job, is then just to try and come up with a good explanation for those sensory patterns, those sens sensory shadows. Um, and I'm using the next slide just to introduce now the formalism, and I, uh, you know, I don't apologise for this. Uh, if you don't like maths, take these things as iconic. If you do like maths, I think this is really useful. I think it grounds questions that we were dancing around with Wanja's presentation. Uh, so if you have a formal understanding, there's a simplicity that you can appeal to in, in providing very explicit answers to some of the questions that were being posed uh, to the presenters earlier on. So here are the dogs and cats again. Um, the idea here is that we're given this sensory shadow, say that I was my retina was supplied with these, uh, this um, data, and I have to come up now with an explanation for what caused these sensory inputs. And I'm going to frame that coming up with, that process of Bayesian inference, um, model selection, which I haven't heard, but I think is a very relevant concept in terms of the unitary aspect of the contents of consciousness, we have to select the best hypothesis on the basis of the evidence for that hypothesis inherent in the data. In variational approximate Bayesian inference, uh, that's a variational free energy, hence variational autoencoder. So I just want to unpack what that, free, uh, that variational free energy is. And I'm going to use this notation. So Q is a belief. It's a probability distribution over discrete or continuous states. I'm going to use discrete states in this talk uh, at a particular time. And all I'm going to do is maximize this free energy functional. It's negative free energy in physics. So what is it? Well, it's just the evidence for my particular um, uh, hypothesis minus a term called the divergence which I can rewrite the divergence between the true posterior belief, the best beliefs about the labels or the causes of my observed outcomes on my data, uh, in relation to this belief structure that I'm trying to optimize. Crucially, I'm going to rewrite that in, to, uh, in terms of the difference between accuracy and complexity. Um, and the reason I'm making a big fuss about this is that it's useful to concentrate on this, this term I think everybody uh, would be comfortable with. Uh, if you like predictive coding or predictive processing, cast as predictive coding, this is essentially just the sum of square prediction error. So this is the prediction error that we're trying to minimize. This, I think, is probably the more interesting term. Um, 
it's the complexity. It's how much we have to move our beliefs away from the prior in order to uh, um, offer an accurate explanation for the data. And it effectively scores the degrees of freedom, the dimensions on a manifold, the number of elements in a hidden state required to compress all that good information down so that I can now generate a fantasy or a prediction that is as accurate as is possible. So those variational autoencoders, they have something which is, you'll see right through the history of things like machine learning statistics, they have a bottleneck architecture. You're forcing the data through a bottleneck with low complexity, simple, low degrees of, degrees of freedom representation, minimum complexity, just to keep Jürgen Schmidt Huber happy, and then expanding it again uh, to actually reproduce the thing that you're trying to predict. That complexity, is, I repeat, is going to play a very important role when we move to the next level of argument, which is how we actually sample the next bit of data in order to confirm or disconfirm our beliefs. Uh, but just a, an illustrative example, cats and dogs. So what caused this? Was this a canine, a dog, or a wolf, or was it a little pussycat or a, a, a bird? Anybody? Andy, what do you want? Cat. cat. <laughs> You've seen this before. That's... Sorry. He's going to go with the dog. Th thank you. <laughs> Well-behaved member of the audience there. Right, so uh, we, have, we have a number of hypotheses in mind. We're going to select uh, this one as providing the most accurate explanation um, for these sensory impressions that, that maximizes the accuracy in this instance. We don't have to worry about the complexity. And that's basically... Um, one could rewrite this in terms of prediction errors and you can get a nice predictive coding uh, uh, scheme out of this. You can also unfold this, uh, no, let's not go there to make a, to make a variation autoencoder, uh, but let's not go there. So that's the basic idea. So we're focusing in this instance on um, ob um, optimizing, and we can choose many different schemes to do that, a free energy functional of the data and our beliefs about those data. So it's all about how our brains are entertained, engaged with the, sen the sensory sampling of the world. Um, and of course, it was a cat. You're absolutely right. But he'd, he'd seen, he'd seen the, uh, the slide before. Uh, so the point being, of course, you will never know what's actually out there. Your job is just to... Um, come up with the most plausible hypothesis. So this was the illusion of a dog. It wasn't actually a dog, but it's still the Bayes' optimal explanation, even though it was completely wrong. Right, so here's the, uh, here's the, uh, the, 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 the key move then. Getting from um, um, classification uh, based upon generative models by, via um, optimizing a variation free energy functional, uh, to active inference and self-evidencing. So the idea here is that there are two ways that we can um, optimize this description of the, you know, the, the goodness of our inference. We can either change these beliefs encoded by our brain in a way yet to be determined, to minimize this divergence, to make our beliefs much, uh, much more like the posterior distribution, much like what um, um, to make our beliefs consistent with our observations, or we can actually change the data that are sampled to optimize the evidence. And that's the key thing. The what this one function has in it everything necessary to prescribe both the perception and the sampling and the behavior um, of me. Um, practically, what that boils down to is this uh, changing beliefs um, conditioned upon a policy um, to maximize this uh, free energy functional of, uh, um, of a policy and changing sensations to maximize evidence. Um, so the only way we can change uh, this through action is by changing the outcomes of the observations. And crucially, what we're going to do is posit some beliefs over policies that are, um, well, let me first of all make a key observation here. What we, in order to count for action, we now have to supplement these beliefs about states of affairs in the world with beliefs about what I'm going to do. And that brings to the table two of that, well, yes, two things, but uh, effectively the same thing. 
these are, these are the reactive dispositions that Andy was talking about. These are, how would I react? How would I act? How would I act? And what are my predispositions to that acting? So they're going to be the prior beliefs about how I would behave in this instance. So that pie, that policy is going to be a sequence of actions, bringing uh, dynamics in, into, into the game. At the same time, of course, because I haven't yet acted, because I've only got prior beliefs, and in fact I'm going to form posterior beliefs about those, about those policies, they have to be counterfactual. So you cannot get away from this. If you want to talk about a perceptual machine that's in a world, that's acting upon that world to author the data upon which it's making its inferences and doing its perception, you have to have reactionary dispositions, you have to have counterfactuals, and they have to have some uh, richness and some depth. And I think that's absolutely crucial. You just can't, you know, this is something that the formalism, I think, brings to the table. So now you have to talk about what implications does that have for a sense of self and a sense of uh, agency that is implicit in, in the action. Now, these predispositions, what should I assume for my prior beliefs about the way that I'm going to act? Well, we already know from there is, isn't there? And I think it's because it's not connected. <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, oh, I see. Sorry, it didn't. Right. It didn't need to be connected anyway. It's a wireless one. Oh, so when did I go silent then? A long time ago. <laughs> Does it matter? Um, where were we? What was I talking about? Counterfactuals. counterfactuals. Yeah, we have to have counterfactuals, yes. So, the, the predilections, the predispositions to the way that I will act, and I will, yes, that's right. So, the answer is rather obvious, because you just go back to Helmholtz or Kant or right through to Geoffrey Hinton. Um, if I am doing my job properly, then I am optimizing my free energy. Therefore, the only belief that I can possibly entertain is that I will behave to maximize my expected free energy. It's as simple as that. Um, and that's basically what this, um, this expression here is saying. It's saying that my beliefs about what I'm going to do, my policies, my predispositions, my actions are um, a softmax function of the expected free energy that will accrue under a particular policy in the future. Notice also, I just want, um, this is why I knew that I wouldn't finish, because there's, there's lots of lovely details there, but I just wanted to point out in relation to the argument about lots of models or one big model, yeah? So I, I think you're absolutely right to, to, to say, well, it's probably all a question of the structure of the one big model. Um, and if you carve the one big model in the right sort of way, then they it will look as if there are lots of little models, and that's absolutely true in terms of, say, hierarchical uh, cleaving um, uh, of the model. There's an all, another sort of carving into lots of little models, which is, uh, somebody actually mentioned it in, in one of the questions about contextualizing or conditioning. Uh, so notice what I've done here, just for simplicity, really, but also it may have implications for the efficiency of the variational message passing, I'm conditioning states of the world, latent or hidden states of the world, on, a on all allowable policies, on all these predispositions that I might entertain because I am the sort of thing that I am. So, that's an, so in a sense, you could say each one of these, there's one of these belief structures that is associated with every policy that I could entertain. So in that sense, there are lots and lots of little models. And then we're going to do Bayesian model averaging or Bayesian model selection to select the, the, uh, the correct model. And I think that would be your argument in terms of that's why there's only one thing in mind at any one particular time in terms of what we're actually doing or sampling or, or perceiving actively. Um, so, oops, yeah, my apologies. Um, so this, um, this, what I'm going to do now is just focus on this quantity here. Uh, and this is where the dynamics gets in. So um, you were pressed about how far have people got with variation altering coders in terms of putting uh, hidden Markov models back in. And the question was not very far at the moment. Um, 
So this is, I think, the next step in terms of putting this variational technology into uh, things like deep learning. It's not easy, um, but you have to now entertain objective functions that run into the future. Um, and that brings us to, um, again, highlights the notion of counterfactuals. These are counterfactuals that yet to have happened. Um, what we do is appeal to a, a Hamilton's principle of least action, and we sort of take a path integral perspective on this. But very, very simply, what we're going to do is consider beliefs or policies more likely if they maximize a path integral into the future over the expected free energy. Now, remember before, the, en the energy was basically uh, accuracy and complexity. When we take the expectation under observations that have yet to be secured, these two things take very, very different roles, but so that you can still see the sort of the, the homologues in terms of the instantaneous uh, um, formulation. Basically, our complexity becomes an epistemic value or information gain, and the evidence becomes an extrinsic value in, in the sense that it scores the degree to which the expected outcomes will maximize my prior preferences. So this is how you get desires, preferences, goals into the expression. They are part of a generic functional um, that can be cut in terms of extrinsic and intrinsic value or uh, epistemic value or information gain here. So this is, this is the pragmatic part of it. But this is that complexity term where we're now trying to maximize the divergence because the, um, in the past, outcomes informed beliefs about hidden states of the world. But in the future, beliefs about states of the world will determine outcomes. So now what we have is this interesting structure here, which is the epistemic value. Uh, for those of you who are mathematicians, this is just basically the difference between beliefs about hidden or latent states of the world with and without observations. And those beliefs can only become more precise, more confident with information. So it scores the degree to which getting those data, those outcomes, those observations will reduce my uncertainty about states of the world. And that's why it's called, uh, or we call it extrinsic value. It's also called uh, intrinsic motivation in robotics, value of information in e economics. It has a number of different um, uh, um, uh, 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 names. Um, I just want to quickly go through the special cases of this, because um, if you haven't seen this formalism before, it may look a little bit magical, but it's not. It, there will be special cases which you have at least all heard of and may actually even recognize formally if I just go through it. Let me just take um, this um, uh, intrinsic value or epistemic value or, or information gain here. I've just reproduced it uh, here. Uh, and I've written it out as an expectation of a divergence between a posterior and a prior. Now, if people are familiar with visual search, um, from formal descriptions of visual search and what parts of the sensorium will, gr will be salient enough to, to specify the focus of the next mechanic eye movement, what you'll find is a literature on salience maps that are usually cast in terms of this quantity, Bayesian surprise. So that makes a lot of sense. So what we're saying is we want to, we can now understand the gathering of those sparse data that maximize my information gain or minimize my uncertainty. And that is a deterministic uh, quantity that can be evaluated uh, in terms of this Bayesian surprise used by people like Itty and Christoph Koch to describe um, saccadic searches of our environment. This expectation is actually just the mutual information between um, uh, hidden states of the world and the associated uh, consequences or causes or outcomes. So it's just the mutual information between the causes and the consequences under a particular policy. So that's nice because that fits in very comfortably with people, uh, people like Horace Barlow's assertion that everything we do is in the service of maximizing mutual information between what's out there and how we record it, principle of minimum uh, uh, redundancy or the principle of maximum efficiency, the Infomax principle by Ralph Linsker, and so on and so on. Let me put now these prior preferences back in the game, but take out a sort of uncertainty, the sort of uncertainty um, which is associated 
with the fact that I can only see the world in a partial or a sparse way. Let's assume, let's make things simple and assume I can actually see the latent state of the world. So there are no hidden states. My observations are the states of the world and vice versa. What happens then? Well, we just have these two terms, but the O's become S's. And now we have a very simple expression which we want to um, minimize, hence the minus sign, which is the divergence between what we think will happen given this particular policy and what we prefer to happen. So the posterior under a policy over outcomes and my preferred outcome summed over time. So this in economics is called risk sensitive control. In optimal control theory it's called KL control because this is a KL uh, kullback liebler uh, divergence and it's what um, people would use in lieu or instead of reinforcement learning when they want to put the risk into um, or accommodate risk. So it's used in plant control quite a lot. Thank you. That's, well, actually, I, I guess it might... So this was the important stuff from, from the point of view of... Uh, well, at least from, from the physicist's point of view. The rest is just flower, is this entertainment, apart from this bit. Um, so I'm now going to take the last sort of uncertainty out of, uh, out of the game, and that's basically the relative um, uncertainty about what would happen if I did that. And that brings us now back to just the prior preferences... Uh, so in economics, that would be expected utility theory, um, and in psychology, it might be uh, things like reinforcement learning. So you've seen that. What I would have shown you is an intuitive example of this uh, intrinsic value, the resolution of uncertainty, you know, the <laughs> epistemic imperatives that drive that sort of good behavior. And I've used a traffic light example, the point basically being you don't need the to know the true state of the world, to know exactly how much uncertainty you can resolve if you did that as opposed to this. And choosing one or the other is a unitary thing. You can only do one thing at a time. So I'm surprised you didn't say that. You're probably sitting there well, thinking, am I feeling well enough to say this or should I save it till later? <laughs> anyway, that would, be, uh, that, would, that, that, would, that would have been uh, something nice to talk about. Uh, so uh, we've seen this. Here's our hidden Markov model, but crucially, we have to think about the transitions from latent states, H's in Marta's slides, uh, states S here, that are conditioned upon stuff we can control. So these B's now are functions of our policies. The transition matrices are functions of our policies. That's how we get behavior and action into the game. You can write down the generative model for these things in a generic way. Um, you can then use off, essentially off-the-shelf um, variational message passing, and then we get to Wanja's uh, <coughs> considerations about the form of the encoding, the processes underlying belief updating, uh, how we can understand those in terms of accrued functional anatomy. I'll give you a little example of a maze, as a, uh, a little rat in a maze is initially a very curious rat and goes around working out where its rewards are, and then it gets bored. Uh, once it's exhausted all the novelty in the environment and then starts to become pragmatic. Uh, and then I was showing you simulations that a neurobiologist would have appreciated, place cell activity, mismatch negativities using that uh, simulation. And then I would have shown off by showing how you can compose hierarchical Mark Markov models to simulate reading of words by contextualizing them, by putting pr empirical priors over uh, beliefs about narratives or sentences. Uh, and then showing you some simulations of saccadic eye movements where in, we don't look at every word, we just look at those good words that resolve our uncertainty about the options in our head that best explain what we will see in the future. Um, and then uh, I would have taken you through some of the electrophysics, well, this is the belief updating from the simulation, emphasizing the separation of temporal timescales in terms of these counterfactuals at different <laughs> levels of deep temporal models and then discuss some of the empirical evidence for that. Um, uh, and then I was shown in silico uh, experiments looking at local and global deviations and compared those to the, um, to the electrophysiological data. And then I would have thanked everybody who has contributed to this talk in terms of their ideas, and I would have ended up thanking you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>